Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 4, Chapter 23 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Testify. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There'll be spoilers for those that have not read the books, and we'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. But man, that ship sailed a while back. Let's just say you should be glad to have it spoiled the whole thing at this point. Me as well. We are one episode free of spoilers. Oh, right on. Okay. <laughs> At this point, can we spoil? Is, is it possible to spoil? Yes. I guess it is. There are eight subsequent books that we could spoil, in addition to whatever happens in the Eslamont books. That's true. Then cover your ears, folks. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence. Listener discretion is advised. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. And we really do mean that. If you'd like to show us your love and support, you can do so by visiting our Patreon link and our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we are posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. I had one addition this week. We received a email. I haven't read this one yet. Great job on the podcast and the series. Long time Malazan fan here. A few points came back to me while listening to the last episode. I thought I would share them with you since you truly appreciate the material. My overall understanding of the Malazan Empire has always been that Mr. Erickson modeled it after the Roman Empire, especially the military, the tactics, and the never-ending hunger for expansion. When reading about the crucifixion along Aaron's way, I always thought that the author was inspired by Spartacus' rebellion. When the Romans crushed the rebellion, they crucified the 6,000 surviving rebels along the Appian Way. Wow. A great scene in Kubrick's movie, When All Slaves Say, I Am Spartacus. Oh. I believe Mr. Erickson switched the roles here, the rebels crucifying the Empire soldiers. Nevertheless, I was devastated the first time I read it. The second small thing is during the episode, you mentioned how things are happening in parallel with Memories of Ice, and you are looking forward to merging the storytelling. I read somewhere he was writing Memories of Ice second and was three quarters along the way when he lost the manuscript due to a malfunctioning memory card. <laughs> no cloud services in 2000 and he couldn't bring himself to start from the beginning so he just started writing dead house gates instead maybe that is why those two books run in parallel anyway great work on the podcast and looking wow. forward to the next 10 to 15 years of you covering the remaining books and digressing professionally we appreciate that man best regards uh, ivan from bulgaria right on ivan is it ivan or ivan either way hey man we love you brother thank you wow Dude, that's quite that's that hits you right in the thanks man that's interesting i would tend to agree that he probably did get inspiration from this historical incident with spartacus rebellion Shoot, yeah you can absolutely see that wow mind blown man this is the, the episode for it too man my mind is blown all this through this uh chapter it's just awesome thanks ivan thanks ivan we really appreciate you listening yep yep this mention of the memory card it reminds me of how mr erickson wrote these books he had this little casio it was almost like a mini computer and it had a couple rows of almost like dot matrix text i've seen that yes it's like a word processor it's a it? word processor yeah, that's mini all computer is. thing that's all yeah. it is and he wrote multiple if not all of the books on this so i guess the memory card failed when he was writing memories of ice that's crazy you know, it's real funny. There's an old Tom Selleck movie, romantic comedy. Dude, my dad and I have seen a couple movies together. I don't know. We're big Tom Selleck fans. And so he took me to see it as a teenager. And it's him. He gets involved with this woman who's escaped from the circus. She's a Russian or Bulgarian who's fleeing behind the Iron Curtain, as it were. And he writes romantic books. And he uses a device like that. I can imagine what a boon that was in that day and age before laptops and things were available. That seems like a laptops were available, I think, where he was... I don't know. We'll have to pick his bones about that. <laughs> yeah. It could be a productivity thing too, because if you don't have any distractions and you force yourself to be in a specific location writing daily, yeah. you can get a lot of work done. It's hard yeah. for a lot of people to do that. Yeah. Especially with a computer, you have a big window into everything. Right. Right on. Yeah. And then we did receive another email from someone named Franklin who's been listening. We were wondering about the three ochre dragons that yeah. flew over in the Warren of yes. the Azath. And apparently in one of Mr. Erickson's interviews, it's been confirmed that this isn't anybody in particular that we know or will okay. ever know. It is just something he added to expand upon the universe. And Dude, that's even better. I'm perfectly fine not knowing who... <laughs> 
this is i mean we i'd like to know every little detail of this sure. series but at the same time the fact that it's bigger than we know yes also leaves that piece to the imagination like we've been talking about where it's like oh yeah you know there's more out there than what we've been shown there's so much more yeah there's he has a whole multiverse out there that is rife for the picking that's awesome thanks franklin thank you franklin and thank you ivan for thank you, ivan. I'm saying that correctly for yeah. listening we appreciate you reaching out to us and we hope to hear from you in the future very much so thank y'all all right chapter 23 part one the chapter begins with a poem quote lacine sent tavora rushing across the seas to clasp coltane's hand and closing her fingers she held crow picked bones end quote and this was from the shaik uprising by Wu. Seeing this poem as written by Wu brings the Big Lebowski to mind since he is the individual that micturated on the dude's rug. <laughs> oh my word, yes. I'm sorry, it's going to take me a second to recover from that. <laughs> Every time oh, I hear Wu, I just hear yes. the dude saying that. Oh my word, yeah. But here's my funny thing with that Wu here in particular. I've seen multiple Redditors. They want to ascribe this to the name of the world. What? Woo. To the Malazan world. Do you know why? I have no idea. I'm not sure I follow. Well, I don't either. But I'm just asking, hey, have you seen that before? I have. No. People, if you correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there are some people I've seen that think that there is a... They don't say it's actually called this, but they're calling it this. And why? Who is Woo? <laughs> You're saying that they name the world, the actual yes. planet of Malazan yes. Woo? Yes. Okay. And I'm curious why. I didn't know if you had any thoughts or if you've ever heard that or not. So that's a very important name for me in that aspect because I've heard this before. For me, it's a Seated Dan song, um, Dr. Wu. Okay. Well, probably need to look into why people are thinking that. There's got to be some justification for it somewhere. Yeah. Maybe in an interview or something. Yeah. Or some forgotten sentence amongst the many. Right. That's what I'm thinking. And there's probably somebody who's, oh, wait, 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 wait. I just saw this here. And the logic is... <laughs> it's like, you're right on reddit there are some people that write a lot i mean i'm like wow i mean they write some serious pieces on this stuff you've seen it right yes these people with these like 50 page responses i'm like gee willikers you know i thought doing a podcast for 15 years was going to be a bad deal but it's like y'all are going to pour a lot more into just that <laughs> than we will i think yeah there's some pretty crazy analysis that i've seen that's yeah. really lengthy it's above my head definitely different than what you and i are doing that's for yeah. sure yeah, for sure. This is more of a fan thing. Yeah, there no literary critique here. I'm not qualified. As I previously mentioned, I'm not a fan of the English scholarly activities. That was always my least favorite subject in school. Oh, my word. I'm more about getting inspired by heroic feats. <laughs> So. I, I, mine was I loved reading and I was always encouraged in my English classes to read what I wanted to because I love to read and mm -hmm. none of my teachers wanted to crush that by making me read something because they weren't making everyone else read something so it was like they let me read what I wanted to so I was happy but I never really learned anything because my school was I'm sorry it was not that great it was <laughs> <laughs> all right we go back to Kalam in Malice City Kalam threw himself into the shadows at the base of a low wall, then dragged the still warm corpse half over him. He ducked his head down, then lay still, battling to slow his breathing. A few moments later, light footfalls sounded on the street's cobbles. A voice hissed an angry halt. A hunter whispered, they pursued, and he ambushed them here. Gods, what kind of man is he? A third claw spoke. She said, he can't be far away. The leader who had called the halt snapped, of course he's close. He doesn't have wings, does he? He's not immortal. He's not immune to the charms of our blades. No more such mutterings. Do you two hear me? Now spread out. You up that side and you up the other. Sorcery cast its cold breath and the leader said, I'll stay in the middle. This is following <laughs> that mindset that I've referred to, the neutral mindset, yeah. where voicing the negativity gives it more power. So yes. this leader has obviously read that book or some version thereof. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because just saying something like that, it brings the morale down so much yeah. more. Saying it verbally. Yeah, it gives power to it. Kalam thought, I, and unseen, meaning your first bastard. This is in response to where the leader is going to be. Yeah. Kalam listened as the other two headed off. He knew the pattern they would assume. The two flankers moving ahead. The leader, hidden in sorcery, hanging back. Eyes flicking between the two hunters, scanning alley mouths, rooftops a ribless crossbow in each hand. Kalam waited a moment longer. 
then slowly, silently slipped free of the corpse and rose into a crouch. He padded into the street, his bare feet making no sound. To someone who knew what to look for, the bloom of darkness edging forward twenty paces ahead was just discernible. Not an easy spell to maintain. It was inevitably weaker to the rear, and Kalam could make out a hint of the figure moving within it. He closed the distance like a charging leopard. One of Kalam's elbows connected with the base of the leader's skull, killing him instantly. And that's a heck of a lot of force applied there. What a bear of a man he is. I'm changing what I, uh, you know, we talked about linebackers or whatever. It's Mike Tyson as an elite <laughs> assassin. With that kind of power, it just, start, oh, I mean, dude, Tyson. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's what I'm yeah. now I want to do this Tyson. It's amazing the combination of the silence, the agility, and the strength. Muscle, just the sheer, like, I'm going to punch a hole through your head with my elbow. (laughs) Crazy. Kalam caught one of the crossbows before it struck the cobbles, but the other eluded him, clattering and skittering on the street. Silently cursing, he continued his charge, angling right toward an alley mouth 20 paces behind the flanker on that side. He dived at the muted snap of a crossbow and felt the quarrel rip through his cloak. Then he was rolling into the alley's narrow confines, sliding on rotted vegetables. Rats scattered from his path as he regained his feet and darted into deeper shadows. From the moment Kalam climbed out of the water onto the shore, Mr. Erickson certainly does a good job of painting Malice City as a dirty, smelly locale. Mm -hmm. It feels like the bubonic plague would have loved conditions like this. I have a visual, and especially because I just watched a movie with my lovely wife. She made me watch. I had I, I don't know why it took me so long to watch it. But have you seen 1917? I have not. Okay. It, you know, World War One trench yes. fighting movies. It's always mud and blood. Just mud, 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 mud. And it's like, so, uh, dude, fan, it's on Netflix, by the way, right now. Highly recommend it. But there is this kind of muddiness to it like this, especially in these old, like, medieval-looking things. I'm always, you know, you always sit in the old cinema of the medieval stuff. Everything's always muddy, and just that's what I'm imagining here. It's, the city is there. It's never painted as a pleasant place. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, uh, you know, yeah, this is the heart of the empire, but man, why here? <laughs> this place is awful. Yeah, but it's the heart of the empire. But why here? It's just so many people living in close proximity to each other. That's true. Another thing I have been curious about, it maybe it's possibly, it could be, maybe it's a, a nexus of power to, maybe there's something there too. Well, there is a dead house there, so there's something to that. Something powerful, very powerful happened here at some point to draw an Azath here is what I'm going to have to assume, right? Isn't that what you would assume? I agree. So this is some kind of nexus of something. And that's kind of what I think all Azath are. They're a nexus point. Yeah, I wonder if it has something to do with Mock. Yeah, that's a good question. Because he was alive not that long ago, correct? I mean, isn't that who Kelvinved took it from? I believe so. It was within the last hundred years. Tattersdale had some involvement with Mock. Yes. And Kelvinved recruited her, I think, after... Yes, after he, I'm assuming, after deposed Mock, shall we say? Yes. <laughs> so uh, a lot of conjecture there. Love to hear y'all's thoughts on that, people. (laughs) You could probably do an entire prequel trilogy with Tattersail. People love that character so much, even though we only got her for like half a book. Uh, Right. (laughs) Well, she's she's great, man. She's cool. In a weird way, Tattersail kind of is almost old guard herself. I mean, she is. If if she's recruited by Kellen Ved, she's old guard. And it's one of the few persons we've had much prolonged connection with that would be considered old guard okay yeah true she was around at that time yeah i mean uh, you know as a singular person not as the not like the bridge burner entity that's a different connection those guys were put together by the emperor this is different personnel picked out by the emperor is different than you know a team put by you know does that make sense it's mm-hmm. more hand-picked feelings by vibe you know yeah an alcove loomed on Kalam's left and he spun backed into its gloom and pulled free his own crossbow doubly armed he waited A figure edged into view and paused opposite him, no more than six feet away. The woman ducked and twisted even as Kalam fired, and the assassin knew he had missed. Her dagger, however, did not. The blade, flashing out from her hand, thudded as it struck him just beneath his right clavicle. A second thrown weapon, an iron star, embedded itself in the alcove's wooden door beside Kalam's face. He pressed the release on the second crossbow. The quarrel took her low in the belly. She tumbled back and was dead of the white peralt before she stopped moving. It's amazing how quickly that stuff works. It's extremely fast. Let's just take another quick moment here to mention about how do you, 
this this chapter's barely started it's already action packed i mean good gracious <laughs> yeah it picks up immediately where we left off i oh, love it love it especially because we all meet you and i you in particular i know love kalam and mm -hmm. seeing this fellow work is a real treat i've been waiting for this i know you have i have <laughs> he has some of the best action sequences in the series yes agreed yeah. always a pleasure yeah Kalam had not died. The weapon jutting from his chest must have been clean. He sank down, laying the two crossbows on the ground, then reached up and withdrew the knife, reversing grip. He'd already used up his other weapons, although he still retained the tongs and the small sack of cloth tacks. The last hunter was close, waiting for Kalam to make another break, and the man knew precisely where he hid. The body lying opposite was the clearest indication of that. Kalam thought, now what? The right-hand side of his shirt was wet and sticky and he could feel the heat of the blood streaming down his body on that side. It was his third minor wound of the night. A throwing star had found his back during the next-to-last skirmish. Such weapons were never poisoned, too risky for the thrower, even when gloved. The heavy apron had absorbed most of the impact, and he'd scraped the star off against a wall. I love how a throwing knife to the clavicle area is a quote-unquote minor wound. <laughs> <laughs> you would think it penetrated at least three or four inches into his body. Dude, I'm losing work <laughs> on this uh, with this wound here. Yes. <laughs> like massively out of work for a while, you know? <laughs> Minor wound. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder if this is one of those scenarios where he's so amped up on adrenaline that he won't feel a lot of the pain until things have settled down. You know, I'm going to have to say probably because I'm going to do a flashback to a movie here. There's a, have you ever seen, there's an old 70s movie about Evil Can Evil. It's an unofficial biography of Evil Can Evil with George Hamilton in the role of Evil. And it's pre Snake River Canyon, but it's got some of his best. And, and, and of course, the Caesar's Palace failure and that, that horrific wreck. It's before he jumps this other thing, it's told from this flashback point of view. He's always going through back on his life, but he's walking around hobbling on this cane. And it's got this big wound care thing over his leg. And the doctor says, well, have a seat. And he sits down and he yanks the big thing off of him, hurting him. And there's a big wound in his leg. And it's like, <laughs> he says, well, how bad is it? You know, because I've got a jump to do here in a couple of hours. You know, he's like, he says, well, give it a week or two. And it'll look like a regular compound fracture. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like, that's, I'm guessing the drilling and all that stuff covers up a bunch. I don't know, but I'm like, hmm. <laughs> that's crazy that's, all, that's always stuck with me as well it's like wow evil can evil okay <laughs> yeah i guess the adrenaline junkies that's why they're so beat up at the end of their life because they're looking for that adrenaline junk man it's just like they don't care <laughs> that he's got a compound fracture happening here i got a jump to do tomorrow man are you kidding me i highly recommend that there's no remaster it's very poorly preserved but you can sometimes find it for free on Amazon Prime, and it's fantastic. It's just because I wanted to be Evil Can Evil. I was, you know, I, I jumped everything. I had a motorcycle as a child, as a, until I was an adult. I was like, man, I tried to jump everything. That's who I thought I was, man. I took one big jump with my bike one time, okay. and I landed poorly, flipped over my handlebars. Oof. Bike flies up in the air, lands on me. We both slide oh. down the hill, and I Oof. limped home. And that was the last of my attempts at being some type of BMX. <laughs> my, my, we, were, we, we, had, we had motorcycles. Uh -huh. And so my brother, he went first and he got into the jumping craze. My dad was so into it. He took a picture of my brother jumping and there's a great picture of my brother jumping his motorcycle, but he breaks his wrist when he lands on that bike. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right? So it's like we have this memorial to my brother's broke wrist. You know, it's great. <laughs> He's probably about 12 or 13. I don't know how old he is. Can you imagine any kid that day? Well, yeah, there's groups of people here in Texas that do this, but I can't imagine many city kids, you know, going, I'm going to go do this. They're, you know, they're too busy looking at their phones, I imagine. I don't know. I worked with a guy recently. He's from Katy, Texas, so okay. born and raised here. He was a professional dirt bike rider, Ooh. and he was doing this as a youth, but it took such a toll on his body. His knee would pop out a socket. Ooh. He had to have his knee rebuilt three times, and he was young when we knew each other. He was, I want to say, 22 maybe. Yeah, he already Ouch. had that much toll. He couldn't really ride anymore. Yeah. He had some wow. pretty good success when he was competing. Wow. Yeah, I know those fellas get chewed up. I mean, you got to imagine how many times y'all seen fellas wreck and they walk it off. But it's like, uh, but you know, you and I both know that them falls cost. <laughs> mm -hmm. They cost. Kalam's mental discipline in slowing the flow of blood from the various wounds was close to tatters. He was weakening fast. 
He looked straight up. The underside of a wooden balcony was directly overhead, the two braces about seven and a half feet above the ground. A jump might allow him to reach one, but that would be a noisy affair, and success would leave him helpless. He drew the tongs from their loop. Gripping the bloody knife in his teeth, he slowly straightened, reaching up with the tongs. They closed over the brace. He thought, now, will the damn thing hold my weight? Gripping the handles hard, he cautiously tensed his shoulders, drew himself up an inch, then another. The brace did not so much as groan, and he realized that the wooden beam in all likelihood extended into a deep socket in the stone wall itself. He continued pulling himself upward. The challenge was maintaining silence, for any rustle or whisper of noise would alert his hunter. Arms and shoulders trembling, Kalam drew his legs up a fraction at a time, tucked his right leg even higher, then edged it, foot first, through the triangular gap above the brace. He hooked that leg, pulled, and was finally able to ease the strain on his arms and shoulders. Kalam hung there, motionless, for a long minute. It's incredible. Even in his weakened state, he's able to perform ninja warrior levels of athletic feats. Oh, my word. Yeah, he's what a monster, dude. What a monster. He's just the best. You know, I think so much of the stuff that I get drawn to him and a lot of these assassins in, in particular in the series, a lot of action, there's different kinds of action. There's action that's big and seen from far off. You know what I'm talking about? Like the big set pieces where you get the armies fighting. Or you have the close, intimate stuff. And you have some kind of mid stuff. But for the most part, when it gets close and intimate, it's usually Kalam because he's such a pleasure to watch work. You know, you can really dial in and watch him get it on. It's just great. Agreed. Him or Ralik Nam? Ralik. Yeah, I like Ralik. <laughs> <too. laughs> yeah, there we that's, go. Yeah, there we go. That's who I'm, that's who I'm referring to, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that guy's great, too. <laughs> Claws liked waiting games. They excelled in contests of patience. Kalam's hunter had evidently concluded that this was one of those games, and he intended to win it. He thought, well, stranger, I don't play by your rules. Then slipped the tongs free, held them out, and lifted them upward toward the balcony's floor. This was the greatest risk, since he had no idea what occupied that floor above him. He probed with the tongs in minute increments until he could reach no farther, then he lowered the tool down and left it there. The knife stayed clenched between his teeth, filling his mouth with the taste of his own blood. With both hands freed, Kalam gripped the balcony's edge, slowly pulled his weight away from the brace and drew himself up. Hands climbing the railings, he swung a leg over and a moment later crouched on the balcony floor, the tongs at his feet. He scanned the area, clay pots housing various herbs, a bread oven on a foundation of bricks occupying one end, the heat radiating from it reaching Kalam's sweat-cooled face. A barred hatch that a person would have to crawl to get through offered the only way into the room beyond. His scan ended upon meeting the eyes of a small dog crouched at the end opposite the bread oven. Black-haired, compactly muscled, and with a fox-like snout and ears, the creature was chewing on half a rat. And as it chewed, it watched Kalam's every move with those sharp black eyes. (laughs) I tell you what, both tension and comedy filled at the same time. Mm, Absolutely. (laughs) A great possibility for a cinematic scene here where he's scanning around and then finally he ends up eye to eye with this dog staring at it as it's chewing on this rat carcass. (laughs) That's amazing. I agree. That would be such a great scene to see. And and we mentioned this already earlier, how much of a cinematic writer he is. It's so easy to see that. And for some reason, I feel like this is part of why we i'm so gravitate toward him there's some other great writers that you and i both like that have this ability but it doesn't seem as common most folks are copies of you know i'm not trying to be ugly but a lot of writers sometimes are copies and you don't have to know a lot there's not a lot said it's like it's everything's cut and paste in in those worlds these you know his his is so unique it's got the comedy it's got the it's got the pathos that you know gets us just choked up. It's got the outrage where we're just so incensed, we just want to just hurl our books at the wall because we're just so pissed off that, <laughs> that this is happening. I mean, this again, this overwhelmed by his writing, man. I have been developing a story in my head for the last twenty years, and at one point a while ago, I started writing it, but I haven't really worked on it a long time. But as we're reading through the books this time. I did realize how important the comedy is to me and why that makes this series better than a lot of the others that I've read. Yeah. I think that's the secret sauce because he's got all the hardcore stuff in it, Mm -hmm. but the comedy is what makes you really love the characters in many cases. It does. You know, it's the only, the other author that does this for me with the funny bits is King. King has that as well. 
or had at some point in a lot of my favorite stuff that I've read of his, there's those moments. I mean, think of that stuff with Eddie. I mean, that stuff is so uncomfortable, but it's so funny. And it's so funny for all of the wrong reasons. And it's like King has that too in certain ways, but with Erickson, I'm not sure if it's, if he just is so good at the, I think Erickson has that unintentional. I mean, it's intended, but it's like that, it's that natural just, there's this, there's a natural humor to be found in almost everything sometimes. And these are just one of those kind of scenes where you're like, this is just really kind of funny, you know? <laughs> it's what makes you catch a breath because of Kalam is going through a gauntlet right here. He's going through the gauntlet. It's like, oh my word, what's going to happen with this dog? You know? <laughs> yes. The stress isn't high enough already. Now he's got to wonder what this dog's going to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Bringing it back real quick, that realization about the comedy how important it is that made me realize i was going for only one aspect of my story writing which was right. kind of the more hardcore serious side of things yes i was neglecting the comedy side which is hard to do it is and i've heard and i don't whether it's true or not but this is i think i was mentioned john cleese's company of making training films and he makes them you know they're going to be funny so you'd probably remember it so when we mm -hmm. laugh about something that's what we sticks with us and it makes a lot of stuff stick with us you know because we'll remember things that we've laughed at even if it's in the middle of a i remember a lot of this kind of scenario here because i've laughed at certain points and i'm like oh yeah i kind of remember that. i remember this because <laughs> it's i've laughed about it i've learned I, I use i remember laughing about things more than anything else don't you so the grawl gelding incident <laughs> it could have just been the horse bit the guy's face right mm -hmm. but instead because it was due to the spitting insult that yes. the Grawl recognized, it followed the lead of how it was raised yes. by the Grawl, right? <laughs> and it was insulted just as the Grawl would be. It adds yes. such a dimension and it becomes, I mean, it's not funny to see somebody bit in the face right. by a horse, but at the same time, it is funny from the perspective that the horse is recognizing the insult, right? So exactly, <laughs> it left such a big impression on us. Oh my we, word. I mean, core memory absolutely well, didn't we forecast that months in advance yes like, it is like i had to cut out at least three or four <laughs> mentions of that before we covered it because we kept talking about it right old face biter <laughs> <laughs> what an epic wow. moment dude it's, yeah but that fellow never spits between the horse's hooves again <laughs> kalam released a very soft sigh and thought Another dubious claim to fame for Malice City. The Malazan Ratter, bred for its fearless <laughs> insanity. Uh-oh. There was no predicting what the dog would do once it had decided its meal was done. It might lick his hand. It might bite his nose off. He watched it sniff at the mangled meat between its paws, then gobble it up, chewing overlong as it considered Kalam. Then it ate the rat's tail, choking briefly, the sound barely a whisper, before managing to swallow its length. <laughs> it's like spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Ugh. The uh, thought of choking on a rat tail. Ugh. It's really funny because I just saw a fox here last night. I opened my door because I, I feed cats, and he, the, the foxes do come here and eat that. But it's the first time I've ever opened the door, and the guy didn't run off. He just kind of sat there looking at me. He's now he's at the other end, about fifteen foot down this walkway from me, but he didn't run off. They're such pretty animals, and they do have a long, pretty. It's a long, thin snout that would really chew you up with, if it had a mouth full of teeth. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You saw a fox. It's been a while since I saw one. They're pretty little things. I did see a mom with some, are they cubs, pups, whatever they have. I think pups, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think they're, I think they're referred to as pups, I think. Yeah, in this foresty area we have by the creek. That was years ago. That's okay. the only fox I've ever seen around here. I have a menagerie I feed here. <laughs> I'm guessing raccoons are a component of that. Yes, I have raccoons, foxes, porcupines cats and deer wow i don't keep too much cat food out for a deer because they gobble it up so quick you have to buy deer corn for the deer mm -hmm. because a cup of that stuff takes them about five to ten minutes to chaw through versus a full bowl of cat food will be sucked up in about 20 seconds and i kid you not because i mean this is a hundred plus pound animal up there yeah. you know, sometimes they're big they're a big animal i mean so i don't let them see because they know me they get to know you we have a group that lives in our complex Every complex in our neck of the woods has a family that lives there because they're not afraid of people. People feed them. People love them. So <laughs> it's kind of wild, man. So, and, and, and not in my complex, but there's a, uh, my friend lives at one where uh, I see some old couples out there feeding them by hand and they're come up to them and take the food out of their hand. Mm -hmm. 
it's by this park area where there used to people walking and stuff like this. We have a beautiful park down here, dude, where the Guadalupe River runs through it. They've got it dammed off for swimming and stuff like that. Is that the one that they did the eclipse viewing yes. at? Yes. NASA yeah. was there? Yeah. Okay. You want to hear something good about that eclipse? What little bit of crowd we had down there, the city said they never picked up a lick of trash. Everyone policed themselves. Can you believe that? That's cool. It's really cool. I was really impressed with that. Maybe the type of person that goes out to see the eclipse is the type of person that goes outdoors more. Maybe so. It takes care of their Maybe family. there's some correlation there and they take care of their surroundings. <laughs> Yeah, we were thou and gracious for that. You know how much I like my little town here. You don't want to get on the bad side of the uh, the enforcer. <laughs> the enforcer. <laughs> it's been a while since I heard that nickname. <laughs> <laughs> the Kerrville enforcer. It's, Remember, it's, there's more than one. Right. Oh yes, right? this is yeah. licensed. I, I, I'm trying right. to start a franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Franchising my name out of the enforcer. <laughs> Ivan, we have an opening over in Bulgaria for you, brother. So just <laughs> please reach out to us. <laughs> the ratter licked its forepaws, rose into a sitting position, ducked his head to lick elsewhere, then stood facing Kalam. The barking exploded in the night air, a frenzy that had the ratter bouncing around with the effort. These small dogs, man, I tell oh. you what, they have such an attitude. Oh, yeah. Walking around my neighborhood. <laughs> there is this one house oh. that has at least four toy dogs. Okay. One of them's a Frenchie. And then I'm sure one of them is a Chihuahua. Okay. And there's another small one. It's not a long haired Chihuahua. I don't know what it is, but it's about the same size. Okay. These things, they have one of those houses where it's got a courtyard and there's a gate that can retract and the the courtyard is where they park their cars like their garage right. is back in there most of the time the gates closed and the dogs are on the inside of it sometimes it's open and the dogs are out policing the road <laughs> and i'm across the street walking and they come up and i'm telling you they get one two inches from my ankle and they're yapping at me and Dude. they have no idea about how big they are compared to me and what could happen to them if I had some ill intent. I, most of the time, I'm just it's laughing true. at them and ignoring them. But I mean, the sheer audacity of these small dogs, it amazes yes. me. My late wife, we had this problem in our neighborhood with dogs. It was a neighbor's dog, a little chihuahua, some small little thing, yappy little thing. Do the same thing to her, but when she turned her back to get the mail, that son of a gun bit the snot out of her, bit a hunk out of her. Oh, out boy. Of, I mean, a big hunk out of the back of her, like, calf. You're like, gee whiz. And, you know, she went to the doctor. The neighbor better be glad we were nice people because they asked if they basically wanted us to, you know, have mm -hmm. the dog off. They were like, no, we don't want the dog killed. I mean, they just want to make sure it's got, got it shot. So they got rabies or nothing like that. But, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but but we had like the people fined or something for not taking care of their animals, having to bite my wife. I mean, come on, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for little dogs, they got a heck of a bite. Yeah, the sharp little teeth. Yes. Yeah. And they got a, they got they, even for being little, they got a pretty strong bite force. You mm -hmm. know, so it's pretty impressive. It's not as impressive as some of the outdoor big cats who can tote like gators and and gazelle up in the trees with them you mm -hmm. know by carrying them by their mouth yeah <laughs> that's really impressive that's, but did you yeah. know the gorilla the silverback gorilla has a bigger bite force than a oh, lion my word. no that's awful <laughs> what a package <laughs> they already they already can beat the stuffing out of you and they can break every bone in your body just by pounding on you they're gonna bite your head <laughs> off it's like just bite limbs off i know that the chimpanzees remove a lot of people's limbs and yeah. uh they're they're vicious little sons of guns too how did this become the nature episode? I don't know, dude. <laughs> Dogs. Oh, one like one, one <laughs> final anecdote here before we move on. I saw a clip. Your mention of raccoons brought this to mind. Okay. Somebody was filming in a city. I'm assuming in South America somewhere. It could have been North America as well. They're filming through a gutter hole down into mm -hmm. a sewer where a battle is taking place. A river otter is attacking a raccoon. <laughs> and it's got the raccoon it's biting the back of the raccoon's neck and the raccoon's trying to scrabble away in the end this river otter subdues the raccoon and pulls it into the darkness of the sewer oh no <laughs> i don't know i didn't see the end of it maybe it eventually got away but it didn't look like it was getting away right it was crazy 
nature's brutal, man. Nature's brutal. I, I got down the rabbit hole of of the honey badger. Oh, because those guys are like <laughs> this guy says they're like nature's crackheads, and he's not wrong. They are absolutely nature's crackheads. But the worst thing is that their cousin, the wolverine, will mm. track you for days in the trees. It'll hang mm. out in a tree waiting to jump down on you. Oh, man. And it's more jacked up and meaner than a honey badger. Yeah, but those things are crazy. Dude, the honey badger, these two stroll into a pride of lions. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, it's a star territory. And they're just kind of strolling through. And then they start, then the lions start playing with them, like batting them around. Mm -hmm. And I did not know they were loose skinned. They like said they can almost turn around completely inside their own skin. And so when like a lion grabs them in the midsection, this thing turns around in its mouth basically and grabs this thing by the nose and then the lion can't let go fast enough <laughs> <laughs> this thing's clinging on to it by its face it's like get it off me get it off me. there's some documentary on youtube in south africa at a sanctuary this guy has a honey oh, badger named stossel, stossel in there yes stossel, dude. It's a stossel. he it's has like this raptor like enclosure from jurassic park <laughs> And Stossel kept devising ways to get out of it oh my and word. steal the bacon amazing. out of his refrigerator. Oh, that was so funny. He was messing around with all the other animals. Eventually, he got into the lion pen, and he got messed up pretty bad. But okay. I think they ended up sewing him up, and he was okay. But, yeah, just <laughs> wreaking havoc in this sanctuary. Yeah, they're wild, man. They're completely wild. I think yeah. the crackhead analogy is kind of apt. <laughs> Kalam leapt up onto the balcony rail. A blur of motion darted beneath him, down in the alley. He plunged straight for it, the throwing knife in his left hand. Even as he dropped through the air, he was sure he was finished. His lone hunter had found allies, another entire hand. Sorcery flared upward to strike Kalam like a massive fist. The knife flew from nerveless fingers. Twisting, his trajectory knocked awry by the mage's attack, he missed his target and struck the cobbles hard on his left side. The maniacal barking overhead continued unabated. Kalam's intended target charged him, blades flashing. He drew his legs up and kicked out, but the man slipped past with a deft motion. The knife blade scored against Kalam's ribs on either side. The hunter's forehead cracked against his nose. Light exploded behind Kalam's eyes. A moment later, as the hunter reared back, straddling Kalam, and raised both knives, a snarling black bundle landed on the man's head. He shrieked as razor-like, overlong canines ripped open one side of his face. <laughs> For all Kalam's bad luck with this dog exposing his position, it turned into an unlikely savior simultaneously. Yeah. I wonder what methodology it used to select its victim in this scenario. Do you think it was simply proximity? It might have been because this guy was up. I'm assuming Kalam's on the ground mm -hmm. and, and this guy's standing up and it's like this, whoever he was, he was going to land on somebody's head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody was going to pay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, but what got the dog barking? Was it Kalam or was it this smelling or the arrival of the hand sent to find Kalam? I'm thinking Kalam was intruding in right. this dog's territory. That's true. It was his balcony. And it wasn't going to have it. Yeah. True. Yeah. There you go. You're right. <laughs> I just like the delay on yeah. it deciding what it's going to do. It's going to finish its meal first while keeping its eyes on Kalam. Well, it finished its meal and it was barking. It was barking like crazy upstairs. And it finally just had enough and either either fell off the box because it's a smaller dog. So he either jumped, finally got enough over, finally got enough of a behind leg to get over the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was like, or yeah, I don't know. I don't know what pissed it off enough to finally come down and get this old boy, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a bad spot to get bitten. Yeah. Kalam caught one of the hunter's wrists, snapped it, and pulled the wow. knife from the spasming hand. <laughs> the hunter was desperately stabbing at the ratter with the other knife, without much luck. Then he threw the weapon away and reached for the writhing dog. Kalam sank his knife into the hunter's heart. Pushing the body aside, he staggered upright to find himself surrounded. A woman said, You can call your dog off, Kalam. He glanced down at the animal. It hadn't slowed. Blood spattered the cobbles around the corpse's head and neck. Kalam growled, Alas! Not mine, though I wish I had a hundred of the beasts. The pain of his shattered nose throbbed. Tears streamed from his eyes, joining the flow of blood dripping from his lips and chin. The woman said, oh, for hood's sake, and turned to one of her hunters, then said, kill the damn thing. Kalam said, not necessary, and stepped over, then reached down, 
grabbed the creature by its scruff and lobbed it back toward the balcony. The ratter yelped, just clearing the rail, then vanished from sight. A wild skitter of claws announcing its landing. <laughs> <laughs> a wavering voice reached down from the balcony's hatch. Flower, darling, settle down now. There's a good boy. <laughs> I'm sure the neighbors love this thing barking at all hours of the night, too. Oh, oh yeah. I have neighbors upstairs who have dogs. They're actually very well-behaved animals. They're actually quieter than the owners. I could imagine they'd be annoying if they got on it because sometimes I'm annoyed. Mm. Well, I think it's just wrong. that you got These aren't small, but they're not big, but they're, they're the midsize. But it's like, dude, this is a one-bedroom apartment. You got two dogs up there? I mean, come on, man. That's not very nice. Hopefully they walk them. They do. They treat them very well. I mean, I'm not saying that they, they treat them quite well, but it's like I, I've always found it's like it's a small, that's a small place for an animal that needs space. Get a cat. Mm. Cat's <laughs> fine with being in the house. It's got enough room to run around and enough room to chill. Mm -hmm. so, Kalam eyed the leader, then said, all right, then finish it. She said, with pleasure. The quarrel's impact threw her into Kalam's arms, almost skewering him on the great barbed point jutting from her chest. The four remaining hunters dived for cover, not knowing what had arrived, as horse hooves crashed in the alley. Kalam gaped to see his stallion charging for him and crouched low over the saddle and swinging back the clawfoot on the marine issue crossbow, Manala. Yes. Kalam stepped aside a split second before being trampled, grasped an edge of the saddle, and let the animal's momentum swing him up behind Manala. She thrust the crossbow into his hands and shouted, Cover us! Twisting, Kalam saw four shapes in pursuit. He fired. The hunters pitched down to the ground as one. The quarrel careened off a wall and skittered away into the darkness. The alley opened onto a street. Manala wheeled the stallion to the left. Hooves skidded, spraying sparks. Riding itself, the horse bolted forward. Mala City's harbor district was a tangle of narrow, twisting streets and alleys, seemingly impossible for a horse at full gallop in the dead of night. The next few minutes marked the wildest ride Kalam had ever known. Manala's skill was breathtaking. After a short while, Kalam leaned closer and said, Where in Hood's name are you taking us? The whole city's crawling with claws, woman. Manala shouted, I know, damn you. She guided the stallion across a wooden bridge. Looking up, Kalam saw the upper district and, beyond it, a looming black shape the cliff and Mox hold. He shouted, Minala! She said, you wanted the Empress, right? Well, you bastard, she's right there in Mox hold. Kalam thought, oh, Hood's shadow. I'm continually impressed with Minala's bravery. Mm. Her loyalty to Kalam is quite significant given what she's riding into here. Especially given the fact that she didn't have that much to do with him. I, I'm, I know she appreciated him you know, helping her family get through the war and get to Aaron safely. I know she had a big appreciation for it, but I never, you know, saw it as much more than that, at least. So I, you know, I'm kind of, I, I, but I do appreciate her skill, dude. He's even, I mean, even Kalam's like, her skill is breathtaking. So it's like, she's a heck of a woman. Yeah, I do kind of question what drew her to him. It's got to have something to do with the fact that he took this entire. It's capability. Well, that him being extremely proficient but no. i think in addition to that it was he took responsibility for the safety of that entire family yes and he didn't have to do that yeah and so she got a true measure of who he is and in a weird way he is a perfect match for her because they were kind of the weird parental units on that vacation run there <laughs> mm. I'm sorry. So, um, additionally we're seeing throughout this section that no matter how skilled someone is Taking on many opponents on your own is likely a death sentence. Yes. Lom had a ton of luck here between the dog attacking the hunter and Manala showing up at the most opportune time. Do you think Opon could be at work here? It's possible in this world, but I don't think he's necessarily favored by them. Yeah, he's not. And I think if it was supernaturally incurred in this world, it would be spelled out at some point. And I don't think there's any, especially in this book, Opon seemed to be notably absent after their presence in the last book right they really got cowed didn't they yes they did you haven't hear, heard hide nor hair from them yeah <laughs> uh, so they may just be letting luck do what luck does without their interference <laughs> <laughs> they might have learned their lesson a little bit maybe so <laughs> and this idea that taking on this many people by yourself it's dangerous you're probably yeah going to get in trouble it's why many experts no matter how skilled you are they say any type of conflict you get out of there if you can oh yeah absolutely unless you're kalam mikar but um, <laughs> he, he should have gone around if he could he would have if he could have kalam's smart which is interesting because 
later in the chapter i'll circle back to it when we get there okay okay because i do want to kind of touch on that okay we go to fiddler and company in the warren of the azath the tiles gave way without a sound cold blackness swallowed the four travelers the drop ended abruptly in a bone jarring impact with smooth polished flagstones groaning fiddler sat up the sack of munitions still strapped to his shoulders and that was incredible luck not falling in a manner that jostled his volatile cargo. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because usually the... <laughs> Haven't you ever seen those old movies where the guys are, sm- are d- driving nitroglycerin and slow driving? You know, it's like, so this is kind of what I envision the Morant munitions being. Some of them are as volatile as nitro in my mind. D- would you say it's more like dynamite or kind of in between? It might be more like dynamite, but you- but, you know, nitro is a component of dynamite. It is, but um, dynamite was invented to make it more stable for transport, that's, right? Yes, that's that's very true. So, yeah, you're probably right. They must have stumbled upon something to make it more suitable to be handled like this. Because it, it would have to be, because if it was nitro, it would have gone up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I think it would have gone up if you had dropped like two or it, dropping one or two foot would more than likely probably <laughs> mm-hmm. make that stuff go off. And no telling how far they fell. Not too terribly far. They didn't hurt. Far enough to hurt his ankle. Yeah. Far enough to hurt his ankle. Fiddler had injured his barely healed ankle in the fall, and the pain was excruciating. Teeth clenched, he looked around. The others were all in one piece, it seemed, slowly clambering to their feet. They were in a round room, a perfect match to the one they had left in Tremorlore. For a moment, Fiddler feared they had simply returned there, but then he smelled salt in the air. He said, we're here, dead house. Crocus asked, what makes you so sure? Fiddler crawled over to a wall and levered himself upright. He tested the leg, winced, then said, I smell Mala's Bay, and feel how damp the air is. This ain't tremor lore, lad. Crocus said, but we might be in any house, in any place beside a bay. Fiddler said, we might. Apslar said, it's simply a matter of finding out. You've hurt your ankle again, Fiddler. Fiddler said, aye, I wish Mappa was here with his elixirs. Ungwints. (laughs) Ungwints. Crocus asked, can you walk? Fiddler said, not much choice. Relock approached the stair, looked down, and said, Someone's home. I see lantern light. Crocus unsheathed his knives and muttered, Oh, that's just wonderful. Fiddler said, Put them away. Either we're guests or we're dead. Let's go introduce ourselves, shall we? Descending to the main floor, with Fiddler leaning hard on Crocus, they passed through an open door into the hallway. Lanterns glowed in niches along its length, and the flicker of firelight issued from the open double doors opposite the entranceway. As at Tremorlore, a massive suit of armor filled an alcove halfway down the hall's length, and this one had seen serious battle. This makes me wonder if the same force possesses this set of armor as that in Tremorlore, the one that was speaking with Moby. Agreed, because I'm always I'm curious of that. Yeah, could it be the same presence? Mm-hmm. Like maybe it can manifest itself. This azath force through the armor yeah, or something yes that's what i'm thinking i, I say that that's what i'm hope. that's what i'm hoping it is mm-hmm. <laughs> one of those scenarios like... where the imagination is allowed to run wild yes <laughs> yes i will go with my version <laughs> <laughs> the group paused to regard the armor briefly in silence before continuing on to the open doors Absalar leading they entered the main chamber The flames in the stone fireplace seemed to be burning without fuel, and a strange blackness around its edges revealed it as a small portal, opened onto a warren of ceaseless fire. Oh, that sounds wonderful. What types of (laughs) entities would come from this warren, do you think? The only thing that jumps out to me is flame elementals. Yeah, that's the immediate thought, and then perhaps... A fire dragon might be able to survive in there if they're immune to fire. For sure. Maybe. <laughs> then, yeah, it would have to be flame elementals. And I, I, I'm not even thinking, because and some people might think demons, but a demon's home is not necessarily in the fire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that was a punishment. So, yeah, that's the only thing that comes to mind for me. So, yeah, flame dragon. Yeah, because yeah. if it's filled with eternal fire, the whole thing is fire. So yeah. whatever lives there would have to be able to withstand fire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. A figure, its back to them, stood staring into those flames. Dressed in faded ochre robes, the man was solid, broad-shouldered, and at least seven feet tall. A long, iron-hued ponytail swept down between his shoulders, bound just above the small of his back with a dull length of chain. Quick digression here. Yes. Erickson's use of the word ochre here reminds me of a meme I recently saw. (laughs) <laughs> I love this it cracks meme, me up. So I saw this meme after 
we read the chapter where the three ochre dragons dove into the tiles within the Warren of the Azath. Yes. So this meme, it has a Uno card that's blank, and it says, stop saying ochre or draw 25 cards. <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> to the right of the that card, it's got a picture of a man with the label Steven Erickson, and he basically has every card in the deck. <laughs> oh, I mean, that is so funny, man. He does That's use a... it. I don't think he overuses it, no, but it's just no, funny because no, 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 no. we just saw its uses twice in two chapters. You yes. know, it, it's just cracked and me it's up. A, it's a beautiful meme. What's funny for me, though, this harkens back to I've read the John Carter of Mars, which is Edgar Rice Burroughs. He was the creator of Tarzan. And this is stuff that was written in the 1910 to 1915 era. So the, he used the word ochre a lot in that. But I'm thinking that's probably an era kind of thing. Wouldn't you think so? Or maybe, maybe it was more widely used back in the early 1900s than it is. <laughs> it is now yeah language is it changes over it time changes. so possibly yeah. i could see that yeah. it's changed so think about how rapidly it's changed in our lifetimes man and it, it, it didn't change that much before that in that fast of a time mm -hmm. yep <laughs> i'm thinking of some of the words my kids are using now <laughs> uh oh i'm so woefully out of touch i don't understand memes very well <laughs> it's like i my wife shows me some and I look at them. I, I appreciated this meme. I understood this meme. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's part of it. It has to speak to a specific audience yes. and a really good meme smith will find the perfect imagery to go along with it. Yes, I agree. And it's, but some of this stuff, I'm like, what? And I always just assume it's me because if everyone uses the same images, it's always the picture of um, Anakin and uh natalie portman whatever her name is oh yeah and then episode, you know, <laughs> yeah, episode that's, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. always these four frames you know, or the, mm -hmm. i posted one the other day that was like these two frames it's these women losing their minds. you know you shouldn't be eating anything you know that's made out of meat he goes oh this is this food is entirely plant-based it's a cat and he's like it's entirely plant-based and they're like oh great what plant is <laughs> because it's the meat plant <laughs> But it's, it, I've seen this same image used for 50 memes, and I, I understood what in 50. And it's, it's quite literally how many of I was like, I've seen that image used multiple times, and I've never got it except for that one. Oh, I can show you a couple that you would get instantly. Okay. So there's one of Gene Wilder when he's Willy Wonka and he's got okay. his eyebrows raised and he's like, oh, yeah, you think you know about this? Tell me more. Right. Uh, there's that one. And then I was just thinking, uh, I am somewhat of a meme smith myself. And okay. that reminded me of a meme where it was the first Spider-Man where Willem Dafoe was like, oh, I'm somewhat of a scientist myself, you know? Right. But the meme, it was a video, actually, where we had some incident in when World of Warcraft Classic was about to come out. M my friends and I tried to, to do a little coup in this guild <laughs> <laughs> for, for naming our cohort of people that were joining the guild. Okay. Cause they named people, they were gen one, they came in around the same time, then gen two, I think we were gen three. So we okay. were coming up with a name and we tried to hijack the vote regardless. Oh, okay. I spent 16 hours on this meme. <laughs> I still have it, but I basically took the rock and clips from the rock and I, I put text over everything. Okay. where it was everybody had a name in it and i was doing all these jokes that if if you were involved in the situation it made sense and okay. uh then at the end because i had nicholas cage from the rock i took a scene from the beginning of face off with nicholas cage acting all smug and right. crazy and right. yeah either way it's fun we should probably start trying to come up with some more malazan memes and posting okay. them yeah. to be honest yeah with you. that yeah. would be a good idea that's a good idea Without turning, the Guardian spoke in a low, rumbling voice. Your failure in taking Icarium has been noted, Fiddler grunted. In the end, it was not up to us. Mappo. The Guardian cut in. Oh yes, Mappo. The Trell. He has walked at Icarium's side too long, it seems. There are duties that surpass friendship. The elders scarred him deep when they destroyed an entire settlement and laid the blame at Icarium's feet. Mm. They imagined that would suffice. A watcher was needed, desperately. The one who had held that responsibility before had taken his own life. For months, Ikarium walked the land alone, and the threat was too great. The words reached into Fiddler, tore at his insides. He thought, no. Mappo believes Ikarium destroyed his home, murdered his family, everyone he knew. No. How could you have done that? The Guardian continued. The Azath has worked toward this taking for a long time, mortals. 
The man turned then. Huge tusks framed his thin mouth, jutting from his lower lip. The greenish cast of his weathered skin made him look ghostly, despite the hearth's warm light. Eyes the color of dirty ice regarded them. Fiddler stared, seeing what he could not believe. The resemblance was unmistakable. Every feature an echo. His mind reeled. The Jagoot said, My son must be stopped. His rage is a poison. Some responsibilities surpass friendship, surpass even blood. Wow. So Mappo mm -hmm. was put in place to find a way to guide Ikarium into the scenario where the Azath could take him. And that's interesting because I had completely forgotten this detail. And some stuff that happens later had caused me to question what the nameless one's original motivations regarding Ikarium were. I agree that this is, I forgot this detail. I had known that the nameless ones had destroyed the village and blamed it on Ikarium. But this part here, where it's kind of like when they used Mappo to be the guardian of Ikarium, did Mappo knowingly enter into this thinking he was going to lead him to his death? That he wanted to get rid of him? Was he, you know, what was the purpose? What was his motivation? What was Mappo's purpose for joining? I understand what would have worn him down. This, I mean, Ikarium, let's face it, is kind of an innocent in a strange way. He has reason. And when his reason is intact, he's very sweet and very kind. And I see how that wears down somebody to making him be your friend. But did Mappo enter into this knowing he was taking him or not? I guess is my big question. I think so. And so it's a betrayal for him to what he was doing to let Ikarium go, even though I approve and applaud, maybe wrongly so, that Mappo and Ikarium got out of there. Okay. I was just kind of curious about that. <laughs> I take it as he has been with him too long and he's developed such a close bond with him. If he had come across this exact scenario, say a year later, with the village being destroyed so close from yeah. a timeline perspective, no he probably would have no issue at all no issue. letting the Azath take no him. No problem, here you go. But <laughs> a thousand years later, these guys have spent every waking moment together and yeah. developed a really good friendship. They have, but I guess what I'm just now starting to realize is how one-sided that friendship actually is. And I'll elaborate on that maybe here in a moment when some more okay. is revealed. Yeah, I want to hear more about that. I don't mean that in a negative way either. I think I get where you're going with this. Yeah, okay. After a long moment, Apsilar quietly said, We are sorry, but the task was ever beyond us, beyond those you see here. The Guardian's cold, unhuman eyes studied her. He said, Perhaps you are right. It is my turn to apologize. I had such hopes. Fiddler whispered, Why? Why is Akarium so cursed? The Jagoot cocked his head, then abruptly swung back to the fire. He said, Wounded warrens are a dangerous thing. Wounding one is far more so. My son sought a way to free me from the Azath. He failed and was damaged. He did not understand, and now he never will, that I am content here. There are few places in all the realms that offer a Jagoot peace, or rather, such peace as we are capable of achieving. Unlike your kind, we yearn for solitude, for that is our only safety. He faced them again and continued. For Ikarium, of course, there is another irony. Without memory, he knows nothing of what once motivated him. He knows nothing of wounded warrens or the secrets of the Azath. The Jagut's sudden smile was a thing of pain as he said, He knows nothing of me either. Apslar lifted her head suddenly. She asked, You're Gothos, aren't you? He did not answer. <clears throat> What? Yeah. The yeah. same Gothos that wrote Gothos Folly, the book we've been fed extracts from since Gardens of the Moon. Amazing. Just wow. <laughs> I love, man, thank you, Mr. Erickson, for this amazing well, I love how he does this. <laughs> yeah. No, so unexpected. Just so unexpected. Oh, by the way, here's Gothos. What? Yeah. <laughs> Who's been built up because I think the first mention of it was when Bellardan found some pages mm. from Gothos Folly about the Barrow. Like, oh, was it, oh, it's the Barrow. That's what it was. The barrow. that contained raced. Raced, yeah, that's right. Some other stuff was mentioned about Rake too, wasn't it? Like and Amanda Piraki or something like that. And they said, "Is this the same guy? Is it? You know, is this who were when they were kind of all the wizards or all the cadre?" mages were hanging out in the tent before the assault on moon spawn that was mentioned there too i think gothos is folly i believe oh maybe that's where that one of the extracts was coming yes. out and people were recognizing his name from yes. there okay. and I, think I can't remember I think, if that was it or not oh, that's probably, maybe fisher. that's fisher oh okay that's, probably, that's, that's probably right that, yeah fisher talking about and amanda 
And so that's probably what that is. Okay. But either way, to put Gothos in the category of writing about race, it immediately elevates him to that Animander Rake level of yes. an individual from yes, a absolutely. history perspective. Yes. So to meet him in person, that's a big deal. Yeah, I wasn't expected to find this person alive. Yeah. And why here? Right. <laughs> how did he end up the guardian? Oh, my word. I know how. Of Dead House on Mala's Island. I have a, I have supposition. Is it the same way that raced? Yeah, I don't know how he ended up the guardian here. Like maybe he traveled here to become the maybe guardian. Just, or maybe he's not the guardian necessarily. Maybe he's just got a mutual interest because, wait a minute. He, he is, is the prison. guardian. He is imprisoned at some remember his son sought to free him. Yes. He can't leave. He's like Moby is to yes. Tremorlore. Yes. He's tied. Maybe he's in one of the mounds out there. <laughs> <laughs> Ser I, mean, I mean, seriously. I think you have to actually enter in order to become the guardian. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're probably right. Sorry. So finding out that he's Ikarium's father, that's another big reveal. Yeah. But it makes you wonder, who's the mom? Right. Because he's half-blood. I like that it's never answered. Filler's gaze was drawn to a bench against the near wall. He hobbled to it and sat down. Leaning his head against the warm stone wall, he closed his eyes. He thought, gods, our struggles are as nothing, our inner scars not but scratches. Bless you, Hood, for your gift of mortality. Mm -hmm. I could not live as these ascendants do. I could not so torture my soul. And what a tragedy this truly is. A son unable to get to his father, thinking he was imprisoned, and us finding out that the father was where he wanted to be all along. Yes, and also the, for me, it's the fact that this, I, I have no better term to use, but the brain damage that's been done to Akarium, mm -hmm. um, that was due to him attempting to free his father. And wow, how poignant is that? Because we're recording this on Father's Day 2024. But the fact is that Akarium doesn't seem to even be aware of a father that, or anything that we can tell. It was uh, alluded to it's by Gothos that he won't know because of the damage. Yeah. What I meant by the friendship of Mapo being one-sided is that he's become a caretaker of a guy like Guy Pierce. What's his face in uh, Memento? Yeah, exactly. It's like it's this horrifying where there's n nothing new can be learned at all. But Akarium doesn't even seem to have that many memories of the past, but he has facility, which is what makes him such a pathetic and scary creature. Because I feel, I don't feel, I don't mean pathetic in a way, but it's like there's a lot of pathos there. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's constantly in this not knowing, very, not, very innocent, like I mentioned earlier, almost an innocent in a weird way, but with loaded with TNT. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just strapped down with it. With, you know, this guy's like a walking atom bomb. Yeah. And he's always on this endless search for something he can't get. Yes. And I'm assuming that's him freeing his father. He doesn't know what it is, but he's after it. And I'm assuming he is the reason for the sundering of the shadow. That's my assumption from what we've learned at Tremolore. Is that Akarim was so awesome in strength that if his father said here, wounding a Warren even more so dangerous. I think that's alluding to he broke shadow. Yeah, we don't know of many other broken Warrens. Yeah. The way that I read that, it felt like Tremolore had it nailed down right there or something was going on. And then he that covered, fragment, that fragment, but he broke it loose or something. I'm trying to free his father. He doesn't even know what he's doing now. That's horrific, dude. Mm -hmm. Gothos rumbled. It is time for you to leave. If you're ailing with wounds, you shall find a bucket of water near the front door. The water has healing properties. This night is rife with unpleasantries in the streets beyond, so tread with care. Apslar turned, meeting Fiddler's eyes, as he blinked them open and struggled to focus through his tears. He thought, Oh, Mapo, Ikarium, so entwined. Apslar said, We must go. Fiddler nodded, pushed himself to his feet. He muttered, I could do with a drink of water. Crocus was taking a last look around at the faded tapestries, the ornate bench, the pieces of stone and wood placed on ledges, finally at the numerous scrolls stacked on a desktop against the wall opposite the double doors. With a sigh, he backed away. Absalar's father followed. This reaction from Crocus, do you think he's looking at this almost like it's Uncle Mammoth's study or something, and he kind of is reminded of that? Maybe. Maybe he's just thinking of Moby. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. You know, just the, that was the last tie to family. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could be what it is, because apparently the interiors of these houses are very similar, if not identical. Right. So it'll have poop all over the rug in front right. of the fireplace. Yes. Shortly. 
They returned to the hall and approached the entranceway. The bucket stood to one side, a wooden ladle hanging from a hook above it. Apslar took the ladle, dipped it into the water, offered it to Fiddler. He drank deep, then barked in pain as an appallingly swift mending gripped his ankle. A moment later, it passed. He sagged, suddenly covered in sweat. The others eyed him. Fiddler panted, for hood's sake, don't drink unless you truly need it. <laughs> I wonder what it would feel like if I drank from it, because the never-ending growing list of aches and pains, mm. all healing at once, I imagine it'd be <laughs> pretty oh, yeah. rough. It would be a real clean, but yet more, it's, a, it's a cleaner, yet more brutal forced healing because it sounds real abrupt. And think yes. about the Azaths. We know nothing about them. There's ways. We know nothing of their ways. Apslar replaced the ladle. The door opened at a touch, revealing a night sky and a shambles of a yard. <laughs> a flagstone path wound its way to an arched gate. The entire grounds were enclosed by a low stone wall. Tenement houses rose beyond, every shutter closed. Crocus asked, well, turning to Fiddler. Fiddler said, I, Malice City. Crocus said, damned ugly. <laughs> Fiddler said, indeed. <laughs> hey now, Crocus. Not everyone gets to come from a jewel of a city. At least Fiddler agreed with him, though. Yeah, this is Fiddler's hometown, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. I think this is his home. Joking aside, he's been to quite a few cities, this being Crocus, as they went through the Seven Cities expedition. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and he never had any comment about how no. dirty or nasty any of them were. And it kind of makes you wonder <laughs> if Malice City is genuinely a sewer compared to the other cities that he's been to. Well, they were in places where there was war and blown up stuff and burn up stuff, and yet you're right. He never made one comment. <laughs> it's like the end of the – do you ever see Alien Resurrection, the one with Winona Ryder and Juan, Ron Perlman is still magnificent, but Ron Perlman makes that same kind of comment about Earth when, mm -hmm. when they get back to Earth. It's like, man, it's like it's a real crap hole, but he doesn't use the word crap. But, <laughs> oh, man, not Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Testing his ankle and finding not a single tremor of pain, Fiddler walked down the path to the arched gate. In the dark pool of its shadow, he looked out onto the street. No movement, no sound. Fiddler said, I don't like this at all. Apslar said, sorcery has touched this city, and I know its taste. Fiddler's eyes narrowed on her. He asked, claw? She nodded. Fiddler swung his pack around to reach beneath the flap. He said, that means close-up scuffles, maybe. Apslar said, if we're unlucky. Fiddler withdrew two sharpers and said, <laughs> yeah. Crocus whispered, where to? Fiddler thought, damned if I know. Then said, let's try Smiley's. It's a tavern both Kalam and I know well. They stepped out from the gate. A huge shadow unfolded before them, revealing a hulking, ungainly shape. Apslar's hand shot out and stilled Fiddler's arm even as he prepared to throw. She said, no, wait. Man, he was ready to go immediately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fiddler don't play. <laughs> he don't play. The demon tilted a long-snouted head their way, regarding them with one silver eye. Then a figure astride his shoulder leaned into view. A youth, stained in old blood, his face a human version of the beasts. Apslar said, Aptorian, in greeting. The youth's fanged mouth opened and a rasping voice emerged. You seek Kalam Makar. Apslar said, yes. The boy said, he approaches the keep on the cliff. Fiddler started and asked, Mox hold? Why? The rider cocked his head and said, he wishes to see the Empress? Fiddler spun, eyes straining toward the towering bastion. A dark pennant flapped from the weather vane. He exclaimed, Hood, take us. She's here. Interestingly, the effort of looking up at that pennant was too much for Kalam as the rag stopper approached the dock. And it makes you wonder how different things would have been had he looked up. Agreed. Would he had taken the same route that he took when he was leaving the docks? Or would he have gone straight there? Was that all due to what was being done to him through Smokra? Confusion? Possibly. Maybe that sense of malaise was placed on him and he just couldn't yeah. summon the effort to look up. Yeah, I don't know. Something. Had to be something. Because Kalam is very thorough. Thorough, Jeffrey. He's very thorough. Mm. Yes. The writer said, we shall guide you through shadow, safe from the claw. Apsler smiled in return and said, lead on then. All right, we're going to stop here this week, and then we will finish out the chapter next week. For standout moments, 
Kalam's continual feats of strength and the skill he displays in outwitting his hunters has been enjoyable. This will be a Festivus to remember. You ever seen the Festivus of Seinfeld? It's the feats of strength comment, but Kalam is such a monster. And again, I now have a uh, Mike Tyson image of him, and I'd love seeing him work. Oh, it's been great. <laughs> I appreciated Manala's bravery and skill in handling the stallion. Yeah, dude, she's awesome, dude. You go, yeah. Manala. <laughs> yeah, that could be quite cinematic, too, in a dark night with the sparks coming off the horse's shoes on it the is. cobbles as it's skidding oh, yeah. around. It had to be real dizzying, you know, because he doesn't know what's going on, but she knows where she's going, dude. She's great. Mm -hmm. Driving that thing hard and fast is hard anytime, but to have to mm -hmm. yank it right and left through streets it requires a monumental amount of effort and skill. I'm getting an image of Lady Hawk with this. I think we've talked about this before yeah. with it. A creaking leather. Oh, well, <laughs> not, not so much creaking leather this time, but yeah, the, the Hauer effect. That's where that came from. <laughs> it is. It is exactly. Yeah. Finding out that the guardian of the Azath named Dead House is none other than Gothos. Mm -hmm. Additionally, him being Akarium's father. That's a double whammy big, right there. Big reveals, Lou, I am your father. And <laughs> it's like, but he likes it, but, it, but at least Gothos seems to like his son, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. The Jagood are very strange. Well, it's like he feels the pain of Ikarium not knowing that he's his father, but simultaneously he's willing to sacrifice Ikarium for the greater good. Great so good. that's a tough situation to be in. Also, I, with the Jagood, it's a weird relationship. Yes. They're so narcissistic, right? They just want to be left alone, do yep. their own thing. Yeah. Well, what little we know of them, yeah, it's very uh, lonely. <laughs> yeah. They need it, apparently. They try and kill each other or something. I don't know. The ultimate introverts. Yeah. Are they goth? Is he the true goth behind goth? You know, no. Behind goth? No, no. They're not emo. <laughs> well, are goths emo? Or... I, think, I think South Park settled this for us. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, in Goth Kids 3, it's revealed that it's, it's a distinction without a difference, I think. <laughs> <laughs> There's apparently no difference between Goth and Emo, and so to make everyone happy with this, it's like there is there may be something but it's like we can't from the outside you'll never know it's like there's no difference i don't think there's a, i don't think there's a difference on their side they just can't come to the conclusion that one is the other uh-huh nice the nameless ones did mapo dirty by yeah. destroying his village and then blaming Ikarium for it to secure mapo's vow to accompany Ikarium. you know that was really just dude i mean that's all i got dude that's a <laughs> huge we, we've we've no it's been hinted at but to have it spelled out but then also thinking about the fact that mapo thinking this is to be the case just still won't do what he was tasked with doing and uh, has become too close to him this is gonna be a tough situation to be in yeah real bad situation the additional tragedy of Akarium not being able to remember his father due to the damage to his mind that's very sad just because of the fact that especially in this world where people can be healed of some things you know, apparently the only healing for Ikarium is for him to be trapped in an Azath. <laughs> I don't even know if that's healing. That's just taking him out of the picture. Yeah, well, that's exactly. It's, it's not healing. You're right. It just gets him out. It keeps the world safe. But apparently, he, you can't kill the guy. You can restrain him, maybe. But you're not going to kill him. Mm -hmm. Apt showing up to help Fiddler and company traverse Malice City through the Warren of Shadow. Mm, that was cool. I liked it. That was really sweet. I really enjoyed that. I was like seeing App show up. I don't know why. She's cool. <laughs> it's always real strange. She's real cool. Yeah. And then finally, the revelation that the Empress is in Mox hold. Oh, yeah. It's about to get hairy. Oh, <laughs> next week is great. Yeah, this is just the warm up, and it was already great. I mean, we uh -huh. had two massive reveals and a bunch of dead claw members, and that's just the start. <laughs> yeah. All right, Billy. Great job tonight. Hey, great job. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? What a chapter, man. I can't seem to recover from what a mind-blowing episode this was, and I can't wait to finish this chapter. It's so cool. I agreed. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.